Hi, my name is Dan Casey. I'm the construction manager on the project. Um, I think most people have been at least uh, to the last meeting or the last couple, so I won't go into all the background and just give you an update uh, where things stand uh, in, in the past month, as, as Young said. And, um, basically, at this point, the, the project has reached a pretty steady state. All of the operations have been up and running for quite a while at this point. We're actually in our, uh, completed our 16th week of uh, dredging activity on the river last week. Uh, and we're, uh, we've been capping, placing backfill material, I should say, uh, since the beginning of June. So uh, we're over the learning curves on all the different operations and things have, have pretty much settled into a, a pretty steady state uh, as far as operations go. Um, just brief description, everybody's seen similar photos. This is taken from a different angle to try and make things uh, look a little different and, and show a different view. Uh, water treatment area in the foreground, in the center of the area, uh, sediment processing, and in the, the background, you've got uh, the uh, cap material being delivered. Just a more updated picture, I think this photo was taken from last week. Um, at this point in the project, from a dredging standpoint, uh, we've removed about 63,000 yards of material from the river as of the end of last week. Uh, and that's out of a, that's out of a uh, projected initial design of about 82,000 yards at this point. So we're somewhere around 75, 75 uh, percent complete on the, the dredging. Now keep in mind that that's the, the, the initial design dredge volume. The, then there's the unknown about uh, the additional volume that's got to take place after uh, sampling uh, of the, the areas uh, you know, occurs. Um, meanwhile, on the uh, backfill side of things, uh, we placed about 27,000 yards as of the end of last week. Um, and that's <coughs> just some rough numbers. Putting a, a, a number on uh, backfill quantities is a little different. You, our intent is to go back and establish the uh, original bathymetry, so really go back to the areas that we excavated and get uh, get material placed back to what the bottom was that, that we started. Now obviously there's tolerances in that. Uh, and then when the, uh, op the, the contractors place in that material, they've also got to account for uh, a fair amount of loss as you're placing material down through the column. So, um, if you step back and say we've got 27,000 yards placed out of, uh, you take the 82,000 yards, you add 20%, we've got somewhere around 90, uh, low 90,000 yards of material between 90 and 95,000 yards. That's, that's estimated. Um, again, there we're somewhere around 25% complete on the, on the back fill. Um, that's really the updates. We're, we're at this point down around transect T42. Uh, that's out of 72 transects across the river. So we're a little more than halfway down. Uh, so things are stretching out. Uh, and we're continuing to address uh, backfill, uh, survey, final survey touch up, as well as some final PCB residual data uh, hits that we've got to go back and, and get up river. So uh, right now the operations are, are spread across a, a fair uh, length of the river. That's pretty much the update on, on the river operation side. Any Sarah, questions? would you like to give a quick summary of the uh, air and the water monitoring sure. before we open to questions? Uh, just as a quick recap, um, I'll start with the water. Um, there, we do water monitoring in the river as well as at, at the intakes. Uh, and the intakes include the Elko Witness plant, as well as the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe uh, treatment plant intake. Um, water monitoring is done for both solids and PCBs. 
Um, there have been no corrective action level exceedances for either the solids or uh, the PCB monitoring in the river or at the intakes. Um, for the air monitoring, this figure here shows the network of air stations that we have. Uh, just as a reminder, this is the uh, staging area over here. We've got four stations that surround the staging area. And this is the secure landfill. And we've got uh, six original stations that surrounded the landfill. And then we also have um, stations that uh, go with the dredge unit as it moves downstream. And there could be up to three stations uh, at each one of those dredge units. There's this dredge unit on the north and south shore. Uh, those aren't shown on this figure because they're, they're mobile stations. Um, at all of these stations, we do um, PCB as well as uh, EOC and particulate monitoring. Um, at the staging area uh, stations as well as the dredge corridor stations, we've seen no corrective action level exceedances for um, any of the um, uh, things that we monitor, so PCBs, particulates, or VOCs. Uh, at the landfill, we talked about this um, last month, we saw a couple of exceedances at our Air 3 and Air 4 stations of our corrective action level. Um, we implemented a number of corrective actions. One of them was to uh, set up two additional downwind stations, which are shown here as PC and PD. Um, so this last month of monitoring, we did have a few uh, uh, exceedances at Air 3 and Air 4 of our corrective action level, um, but the results that came back for PC and PD were all below our corrective action level. So the, the exceedance was just limited to SLF Air 3 and Air 4, which you can see. Which are immediately at the land. And as they went further out, there was no exceedances. Yep, as we got to PC and PD. summary for the last month. Thank you. And then I also wanted to share good news. Uh, we had one removal action that was continuing on within the <coughs> soil, which is around this area in T1. So yeah, it's around this area because it's the Akoa Bridge and you can see it over here. So this is the upland T1 area. All of that uh, contaminated soil has been removed, it's been completed. You might see some platform with some material in there and that's just for the um, in-water capping component, but all the land-based work is complete. And as of last week or early this week, they had um, placed uh, seating material and erosion protection material, so that's good. Okay, now we can open it up for questions. I believe you had a question. Yeah, um, the gentleman that spoke at the beginning talked about PCB hits, and you said that you were going to look into that. Where is that? Um, maybe I was talking about the, uh, so after we dredged a, a DMU, a, a, an area that's been identified, and we've got a, a design dredged area, after we reach the design dredged uh, limits, we, that material comes out, we go back in and take a, a number of samples across that area. So, the, and there's uh, criteria that we've got to meet uh, in order to call that dredging complete. Um, there's been a number of, of dredge management units that the sample has not met cleanup criteria and we've gone back, and that's what I was saying, we've gone back and done extra dredging in those, those locations. And so have you tested after that second dredge to see if there's still any hits? We, we do. Yeah. Uh, and most of the time what we're finding, and I, I, I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head, but in, in most of the cases after the second pass, if the first pass didn't get it, uh, the second pass has, except in one, lo in, in one or two instances we've had to go back and do a third pass. And um, in the first meeting that I attended, I had a lot of questions about the species, about the turtles, about the eagles, the ospreys, whatever other species that are affected besides fish. I wondered if there was any reports on 
the studies that were being done on those because you said, yeah, we're, we're monitoring the turtles and the, the birds and the, you know, so just wondered. Uh, so like, during then, the remedial investigation, there is an ecological risk assessment and a human health risk assessment. <coughs> Both were conducted at this site. As part of the ecological risk assessment, we physically collected fish, but we did not physically collect and kill osprey and sample for any of their you know, tissues or anything like that. Fish is the only species that physically were collected and analyzed for tissue analysis for you know, PCB levels. I think for other pilots, we also did some worms as well. All the other higher uh, species of animals, birds, you know, four-legged animals, they're basically calculated their risk. It's not based on actual tissue collection analysis. So I don't have that data specific to the site, but it's basically calculated in based on other information. We have risk at the site based on the fish tissue levels, and that's what causes us to remediate the site but we don't have a specific data for any of the four-legged animals or any of the birds specific to this site. And we monitored them like osprey is protected, eagles are protected. The nest, we monitored the nest where we're doing work. But that is because those are protected species of birds and they, we've been told this area might have those species of birds. So we're required to examine when we're doing the work or about to do the work, look at the tree canopy within certain radius of our site, make sure we're not gonna have an impact on any of the uh, new birds coming. So that kind of survey was done, but like once again, we didn't collect any of the tissues from the birds. Uh, so I have a question about the air quality sampling. What size of particles are you guys? Is PM 10? 10 micron. Yeah. I have a question. Um, you spoke to the monitoring at the uh, intake at the, um, um, the two intakes. Is there also an agreement with respect to in taking samples at the, um, there's another intake at the St. Regis in Quebec. Is there any action yes, there? Yes, there is. There was a request made to SRMT Environment Division. SRMT Environment Division communicated with me and based on that communication and also a letter that EPA had received from MCA there was an agreement made. The agreement is such that if we have a, a negative hit at the SRMT intake, which should never happen, mm -hmm. but if it does, then that would be the point at which we also examine M MCA's intake as well. Since it's considered Canada, SRMT is going to assist us in collecting that sample, give it to our conic team, our conic team will analyze it. Yeah, I thought I heard something about that. I was kind of curious to find out how that was all going to work out. But That's how it's all there's planned a, out. There's a contingency in the case. Uh, yep. sure the, uh, because it's not something that any intake typically reports on a regular basis, right. like a routine basis. So it's, it's good to see that that uh, contingency is in place. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so with respect to the lady's question and following up on the biological monitoring, um, so you're required to look at, um, you know, to identify any sites of osprey or any other kind of uh, protective species in the area um, at the start of the project. And then to, with respect to monitoring the nest, is to look at fledglings and to, to understand whether or not that they're there's any that exists. What, can you just describe if a little bit more? For the osprey, they're looking for the nest. So do we have nest? Because that would have impact on our schedule. 
Okay, so then you would have to then... And we have to do that every year of yeah. construction. And if there were nests in the area, there what kind of... Nests. What, if there were nests in within the prescribed area, what sort of um, actions would you have to take? Or it depends on the authority that controls that. That authority would not be EPA. The controller would be U.S. Uh, Fish, and Fish and Wildlife Services. Okay. So they're the ones that. who tell us which species are protected and what we need to do. So they told us in this region of our site, there is osprey, there is a bat, um, and then little brown bat, ospreys, little brown bat, uh, golden eagle, bald eagle, yes, and peregrine falcon. Okay, so for those bird species, other than the bat, the requirement was surveying for the nest, okay. because that would have impact on our schedule. For the bat, it was integral because of our tree trimming purposes, and so we needed to look at that. To see whether or not so different things impact different components sure. of our site. What about you know, amphibians or any other uh, turtles or anything? Like we, did, we did the same stuff um, for the wetlands that they're going to remediate in a month from now. Um, our conic hired a, a contractor who went in and did a full survey for Blanding's turtles. Blanding's? Okay. Um, and they also, the PRP did well this year with altering their schedule. They even did it for nesting Canadian geese when we had issues this year with them. Yeah, not necessarily. A, a big, uh, Wasn't uh, necessarily, but yeah. they still did it anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just thinking of not a, um, a species of, at risk, but. Uh, right, but I was just using it as an example that the company still did it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, so we, that's based on the New York State species at risk? Yeah. Okay. Some of them are federally protected, but some of them are state protected. So we're given, the PRP is required to write to both authorities, find out based on our site the work that we're going to do, what are the impacts. They then tell us, here are the species that you need to be careful for and this is what you need to do. So it's incumbent upon the PRP to reach out, or PRP's contractors, to reach out to both the state and the federal authorities. Is the, the kind of the bottom line what you're trying to do is to mitigate the risk as much as Correct. feasible without, I mean, obviously the project has to proceed, but trying to find the best possible yeah. ways to mitigate the, yeah. any impacts that would be on the yeah. world. So for instance, I talked to you earlier today, we had to adjust our schedule of work start for the upper portion of our river. Yes, and that would be every year. And that's for the drifting, potential spawning of the sturgeons, which are protected. And even though we don't have spawning sturgeons there, the drift may occur up to our T6. So from T1 to T6 work, we can't start it until mid-June. So that was a coordinated effort that was discussed with the state of New York. Because that particular species is New York protected species. Would the, um, so again, it's based on the New York State and the federal. Um, what sort of level of discussion would you have had with respect to other species of cultural significance with respect to the tribe and, and, and the other? Um, community members within Aquasasta? Well, I'll, I'll take the first Go step ahead. and then you can take the second step. The first step was before completing our design, um, the SRMT Environment Division gave us a multiple page list of culturally sensitive species. And that list included both plants, aquatic, and also uh, surficial plants, and it included also animals. Um, and then recently, we've been working with SRMT Environment Division regarding further trimming that down specific to um, planting purposes that are of TK uh, cultural interest that we're going to be replanting in the future. Okay. So it started off with a much bigger list, crossing, you know, both plants and animals. 
to narrowing down for after the remediation is done for the habitat reconstruction, this is what we're interested in as Akwesasne. So that's partly how it worked. I think Jay might have had more um, to yeah. explain, and then we'll go to you for the follow-up question. In, in supplemental work to this project that's going on, um, as we are a, a area of concern here, there's actual area of concern work with the BUIs going on. So there has been um, work done with uh, turtles, additional work done with brown bullhead, um, avian for bear mammals, sturgeon, that the Environment Division Office has done. And some of those reports are on our uh, website. And uh, you can look at the data there. So, and most, a lot of those are focused on removing the BUIs for cultural use. At least that's what our office focuses on. Sure. And then our shared partnership with DEC, they look at removing the BUIs to benefit them. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. And I was going to just add to that. That was that. Um, there also was the Akwesasne Fish and Game Advisory, which mm -hmm. I thought there was the additional species that were collected to inform that as well, which is probably some of the published material you're referring to that's on the website. Well, that's, that's the xenobiotic stuff that I sent to you. Mm -hmm. That was dated, the, the data stuff. We just collected all the fish farm. Mm -hmm. So that's publicly available. I, I believe I sent it to you, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Been a busy summer, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, you know, if you're coming and going sometimes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah, you mentioned that the tribe provided a list of plants, cultural, with this cultural significance. And I wondered if there was a study on the effect of the project on plants, because you can harvest a plant and do a test. I know that you said uh, fish is the only one you're testing, and air and water, but I wondered if you were looking at the plants because. People we rely have on not the plants. done it, but I believe there were additional work being conducted by SRMTED. Um, that will be starting this fall and next year. Oh, to see if the plants were affected? To see if the entire plant was affected. Because like Young said, um, we did uh, analysis for um, risk assessment, for human risk assessment, and a lot of that comes from um, other published material on plant materials don't uptake PCBs, but with the, the traditional use of the plants, a lot of it's with the roots and drying the roots without peeling them. So BIA has funded us to, to do our own study. Okay. Are you going to be consulting with the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne on that study? Because it That's not be my project, but um, Jessica, who was in the meeting okay. this morning, I'm sure she will. teams working at the Grass River site through like about mid-November. Maybe the activity will be less, but you know, normally we can work through mid-November and then it really does freeze over sometimes or it does freeze over or it's just too cold. We have to demobilize at that point. Um, so while right now the scheduled meeting, the last one is September 11th of this year, it doesn't mean the work stops at the Grass River. The work will continue. Um, the other item that we as a team have been working on lately is we have learned about Snug Harbor. There's 
you know the Seaway? If you live around here, you know about the Seaway. Seaway has a vessel in an area that's called the Snug Harbor. So here's the Grass River. This is their Snug Harbor. This is about a third of a mile uh, from here to here. But this is where they dock their vessel. They have a tugboat. I think it's called the Robinson. Robinson Bay or Robinson. Um, they ordered a new tugboat. It's a larger tugboat. So with this size and the engine on it, it's going to have an impact on our current uh, remedy that's chosen for this area because they need to come around and then turn, be able to duck, turn, go out if they need, you know, if they wanted to use their new vessel that will be coming. Um, so that prompted us to discuss with the PRP, Arconic, on a design change. So Arconic has been studying uh, the necessary design changes and we just received within like a couple of months the, the amended design. So as a team, collectively, we reviewed it, we commented on it, uh, we received some responses, but we're currently still in the review, revised phase of that. Ultimately, once that design is agreed upon by everyone, that would mean um, some additional dredging within this channel and some <coughs> design changes. And that change will require a document that's called ESD, which means uh, explanation of significant differences. So from what we had in the record of decision, the ROD, it's some changes. These changes would have more dredging involved in an area that we were previously planning to cap. And the reason why we're doing it is because of this new vessel that is parked or will be parked in our Grass River lower section. So that document would be needed normally with the ESD within our EPA organization. Uh, we could do the work and then document it in an ESD, publish it, and that's good. Currently, there's some change in the policy going on, so potentially I might be required to document first before I could start the work. We were, once we have settled on the design and agreed, we're going to start the dredging in that portion this year, this fall. So since we're coming down, we're more than halfway down the street, uh, down Grass River, we're hoping by late fall to be in this area and start the dredging. We may not be able to finish it, but finish it next spring. Um, but now I'm not sure yet if I will be able to do that. But regardless, there might be a need for me to come back after September and have another meeting to have public notification of like, hey, this is what we're doing. Here's the design change. Here's the reason why we had to do this design change. Here's some schedule information and uh, go from there. So I don't have all the answers to that one on when it's going to happen. Is it going to require a public meeting? I'm not sure yet, but stay tuned. Wouldn't you want to have a meeting anyway, even though I don't know the requirements for a public meeting, but it only makes good sense to continue to inform the public. About that's why I'm informing you, even though I'm not supposed to right now, because I think it's information that's useful. One way or the other, I like to stay, keep our communities informed. As I was sharing with my colleagues, if you're going to spend time here coming to our monthly meeting, this is at a minimum the little bonus you could get. You get prior notice even without newspaper notices that you know this work is coming. Any other questions? Not too many questions tonight, huh?
not even, uh, yes. Yeah, so what's the actual end date for this whole project? Uh, probably two more years at a minimum for the capping, for the main channel capping. And then we also <coughs> have habitat for construction that's needed. And then for this site, since we have some capping component, meaning we're going to have some contaminants remaining, we have to continue on with monitoring. So at a minimum, twice a year, I mean twice every five years, at a minimum, we'll have monitoring. We'll have that monitoring data, which will culminate into a five-year review report. That's another document we end up producing on a five-year basis. So the fish monitoring will happen all for, all to, for the next five years? Forever. Forever. And even, you said, in the future you could monitor perch, wildlife, sturgeon. At some point, and that be restart, added. could be added within it, could be next year, right? Probably so. not next year, no. The monitoring for the fish won't start up again until the remediation is done. The basic remediation will be done at least until 2021 because we're calculating 2020 will be the main channel capping, 2021 will be also main channel capping. Yeah. So likelihood would be, you know, um, 2022 will be when we start fish sampling again. And at that time you can include those other species that occur. It doesn't make sense to because the fish tissue levels will not drop immediately. You know, so... Um, additional sampling on game fish wouldn't happen until the indicator species would let you uh, adjust the consumption of it. So if the indicator species tell you that it's eat no fish, then those game fish are included in that even though we know that they're still being consumed. Does that help a little bit? Or? Yeah, I just think of the people that eat that fish, perch, walleye, sturgeon every day, and, and just for their sake, for their health, it would be good to study it and increase the scope of that study of that fish so that you're, you're looking at a wider area so that the Alpazas Lono fish in and eat from every day. Why would you think that that would stop people from eating it when there's already an advisory to eat none? And that basis is because we have contamination in those fish. I don't think just examining the species of fish that they're interested in, analyzing it, and still showing there's contamination and DOH was advised would still be eat none. I don't think it's going to help with the population is currently eating those fish. But what I would say, though, is in these little packets that we've had up front the past couple of meetings, um, there is some advice for people how to reduce the, the concentrations if they choose to eat, even though the advice that we have is to eat none. If they were to choose to eat it, there's, there's some specific advice here indicating that they can cut away the fat along the back, remove all the skin, cut away the V-shaped wedge, turn with the dark fatty tissue, slice off the belly fat, and that would reduce concentrations of PCBs if they were gonna choose to, to eat it anyway. So, I mean, there is some advice for people that choose not to follow the advisory and are still going to be eating the fish regardless of the species. Jay, the advisory that's produced by SRMT, isn't it in dual language? Or, so that might also help to look at. I mean, I think, I take your point because I, I think that the trouble is is that we have a jurisdictionally complex area. And you have populations who don't necessarily follow fish advice. If you're from the Akwesasne, you don't necessarily follow the tribe's advice and the tribe and so I think that that's, this is a central to the issue that I've identified, I've brought to Environment Canada and Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario. I think that there should be additional monitoring that they conduct in concert with EPA because I think that we um, still don't really truly understand fish movements within this very complex section of the river. 
Um, and uh, so, uh, because, and so that's the direct an result of the answer to your question, because there is certainly do not eat the fish. And then there's a line in the river. And at the other end of the line, you have, um, and I don't believe MCA has a, um, a similar fish advisory except a long existing one that goes back to the 1970s, which which women and children of uh, don't should eat fish in the river. And then, but it, then it's pretty hazy, yeah. right? So I would really, you know, would encourage MCA to think about that a little bit more carefully. If you default to the Ontario Ministry side of the issue, um, you're really talking about uh, fish that are collected on the north side of the river. There is no fish collected south of Cornwall Island or south of St. Regis Island uh, that is in in that area. So this is a this is an unknown piece of, of, of water, which is again in this no man's essentially it's all within Aquasasne, but you know the monitoring agency. That uh, on the U.S. or the Canadian side, you know, there, there, this is where it is and it's in coverage. So I really think this is an area that MCA should be requesting for um, for monitoring to be done. And I make that point to some of the people that I talk to. Quebec uh, monitors on the south side near Saint Anaset, but it's quite a bit downstream of this. So this is where I think you're on to the right thing, and I would encourage that the, through MCA, that you request the Environment Canada or Ontario Ministry of the Environment to undertake this monitoring. Um, and I've mentioned the same too. So that we met with Environment Canada today and I pointed this out. I think the other area that you've touched on is the ecotoxical, eco, uh, ecotoxicological and the idea that there's no monitoring that goes on with um, while the project is underway. But the whole ecological risk assessment is underpinned by fish concentrations uh, and everything else is calculated. So we have, without any fish, sentinel fish monitoring underway, then we really don't know where we are with respect to the ecological risk assessment. At least that's my understanding, my point of view. And um, so there, in, there lies a, a data gap in my sense of it while the project is underway, the decision not to monitor fish. Um, you know, I understand it from a human health point of view, you have a do not eat, makes sense, but it doesn't make sense if we really want to understand what are the ecotoxicological eco eco impacts on the broader wildlife, um, because we are calculating that based on the fish concentrations. So during the remediation, at this site, we have shown that the fish tissue rises during a dredging project. Right. We've shown it already at this site. Many other remediation sites, if they're dredging, the fish that resides in that body of water, their tissue levels rise. So that's a known information. At this site, it's currently eat none because of the levels are high it's going to rise, meaning it's going to go higher than the levels that we have already data for. During the construction, knowing all this, it doesn't make sense to collect fish tissue data for the purposes of finding out what is it doing to the animals. It's potentially higher, I don't know, but it doesn't impact our work. We need to continue the work and get it done, right? So while if I had unlimited resources and I had PRPs that agree with me on everything, sure, for information's sake, somebody's curious, let's get that information. But as a project manager, with a given authority what I can do and not be able to go outside of that, I don't see how gathering the fish tissue now would be helpful for this project in any way. So that's one of the reasons we're not gathering that information. As soon as the remediation is done, we're going to start gathering fish tissue data again. Because at that point, I want, I'm want i gathering that data so that I could show the trend, yes, our remedy implementation is having an impact. Look at the fish tissue. It's going down. 
But to piggyback on that a little bit, that data is available, correct, for the fish that were collected during the... It's all public yeah. information. So it's available for the Grass River site. So if you're interested in that for a specific area of the river, when they were addressing one of the most highly impacted areas during the pilot study, you could see how the fish levels changed. Fish levels changed and then how that was... Like came down the next year. Right, right. So you could kind mm -hmm. of see that trend for this exact environment. And that's kind of typical in all sediment remediation sites. Yeah, yeah It I goes up during the remediation and then ra it goes back down quite rapidly. And at this particular site, it went down, instead of just going back down to the same level, it went back down to the original trajectory of going down. And the reason why we had to require the PRP to do remedy, remedy implementation was it kept going down, but there was a point at which it didn't go down any further. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it shows that we must implement a remedy for the site because by not doing anything, there will be a time where it's not going to be enough, just leaving it to Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. You know? And there will be some sampling done this year, just outside of the grass, all the way to Racket Point. Um, for the former Reynolds property and the GM Superfund property, which are already completed. Mm. So they, so still, this do, is they still do annual monitoring onto there. We're just not doing it in the And cabinet. this is GM. So their remediation, they also had some remediation in the um, sediment, and that was completed a while ago. So for a while, we were doing coordinated fish mon uh, monitoring. But once we were close with our design completion, we stopped monitoring for three, we will be stopped to monitoring for three years. They're continuing on, and I believe they're on a schedule of two years out of five. I mean, I just want to emphasize, you know, I am in favor of this project. This is the right thing to be doing and, 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 and sort of thing. And, uh, but what I'm doing is I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate in some cases, based on my knowledge. And I work for a community based organization and so my role is to sort of is to I think to try to bring these items um, you know and some of which we you know was discussions that happened many times beforehand but you know as you get into the project you learn uh, things as you go. Um, in other projects I've been in Bay of Quinty where there was PCB contamination is actually an event that occurred where PCBs were actually uh, by neglect uh, put into the bay and, uh, and, and therefore we did post monitoring afterwards. There was an immediately um, increase in PCB concentration in uh, um, indicator species of brown bullhead was a particularly uh, effective one. So what happened is that if we had not known that this uh, pulse had occurred, we would have affected the way that we interpreted the, what was happening in the bay. So having those concentrations, understanding what the concentrations were, because a brown bullhead can live you know, 10 years, and so what you have is a pulse, but you don't get rid of those uh, PCB burdens over time, right, right, right away. It, it actually is a residual, and what happens is you start with small brown bullheads that stay in a very small area, but as they grow older, they tend to migrate outside. And so they carry their PCB burdens with them and so all of a sudden you're getting hits outside, well outside the area where the, this occurred. So that's, um, I think, been helpful information. And so why I think that uh, even though, it, you know, it, the, I understand the costs and the, I understand there's a do not eat, I think having uh, information on fish concentrations during the project is still meaningful and, and of value. Um, and, and I do believe that there is something, as the lady suggests, that there's something to think about with respect to the ecological effects. You're not going to stop the project because of it, but it may tell you, you know, what is the scope of the impact and whether or not we can then see, you know, bald eagles that may or may not have impacts. I mean, the trouble is with a species like that, of course, it can fly long distances. We know that we have bald eagles that was ever in the river just above the dam last week, and there were a pair of bald eagles flying around. So, um, you know, I, I, that's the concern I have. It's, it's, it's a, in order to develop enough data so that we can understand the future impacts um, many years down the road. So having enough data 
is something we definitely have at this site, especially the fish species. And being consistent with the species is also helpful. Yes. So we have over 20 years of fish tissue on an annual, annual basis of three species, two of which are adult and one is a um, young of the year species. The young of the year is a very good indicator for more localized and localized short period of time changes and that's the reason why that age group was chosen. And we have data for this for annual basis for close to 20 years. So I believe we have wealth of information, and as I said before, that is one of the reasons why during the construction, we decided not to um, have that. Because during the pilot, we did do it. We know what the impacts are gonna be, and it's also consistent with many other sites. So um, if I need to drop anything, that is one thing I decided to drop. But we'll pick up immediately as soon as the construction is complete. Come to these meetings in a while. No questions? No, I trust Jay. <laughs> okay. Jay's a good egg. Yeah, he's doing a good job. He is. Any other questions? No. No more? Oh, I'll save it for the next meeting. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, something for the next in the meantime, if anyone does have specific additional fish questions that they would like to have answered, just so you have it, I have a phone number for our fish advisory team. If anyone would like it, stay with them. It's 518 402 7800. In case you think of anything in the meantime, since it is about a month out in between meetings. And also we have information on our website at www.health.ny.gov forward slash fish if you'd like to look up specific advisory information. We prefer not to talk to a person. Well, okay. I think we should end the meeting and I look forward to seeing you all on uh, September 11th, same place, same time. <laughs>